And one of the reasons I was drawn to this story is that island really becomes a laboratory. It becomes a laboratory testing the human condition under very extreme circumstances. And inevitably, it begins to peel back and reveal the hidden nature of each person. Do you see acts of selflessness, resilience, heroism, and bravery? And do you see acts of shocking brutality and murder and cannibalism on that island? I'm Michael Tamblin, CEO of Rakuten Kobo. This is Kobo in Conversation. My guest is journalist David Graham, author of nonfiction page turners including The Lost City of Z, A Tale of Deadly Obsession in the Amazon, and Killers of the Flower Moon, The Osage Murders and the Birth of the FBI, to say nothing of his many incredible articles about crime and adventure that he's written over the last 20 years for The New Yorker. And he has a new book, The Wager, A Tale of Shipwreck, Mutiny, and Murder. It's about seafaring, nautical battles, castaways on the brink of starvation, but it's also about the rule of law and the very fabric of society and social order. David Grant, welcome to Kobo. Oh, thank you for having me on the program. I appreciate it. The joke among booksellers is there are plenty of nonfiction books out there that should have stayed as a magazine article. The wager is the exact opposite of that. This is a story that has so many facets that has so much detail that is it's barely contained by its covers. We learn about life at sea in the 1700s, the role of the Royal Navy in British life and in British geopolitics, and then this very personal story of the British man of war, the wager, its crew, the disaster that befalls them, and then the stories of their crew that still echo today. Uh, so let's set the stage for the wager in the broadest possible strokes. The British Navy assembles a squadron of ships and sends them off to sea. What was the goal and what were they trying to accomplish? Yes, they are set off to sea uh, in the 1740s on a secret mission as part of a squadron of ships. Um, and their secret mission is to try to capture a Spanish galleon filled with so much treasure. It was known as the prize of all the ocean. So they are supposed to cross the Atlantic, then around the tip of the Americas, head into the Pacific, and to try to intercept uh, the Spanish ship, the prize. Uh, so the expedition, believe it or not, that was this mission, uh, and it had a whiff of piracy about it. <laughs> and this this whole mission and the pretext for it was was set up on what seems like it, you know, especially flimsy terms, even even by geopolitical standards. Oh yeah, it was completely ginned up. Um, the war in which this takes place was known as the War of Jenkins Air, which is obviously a very strange name for a war. Yep. So why was it called that? Well. Imperialists in Britain seeking to expand the British Empire into Latin America had seized on this story of a British merchantman named Robert Jenkins, whose ship had been boarded by Spanish forces in the Caribbean, and they had purported that they cut off his ear. Um, this event uh, uh, took place um, many years, actually, earlier. But it was seized on and trumpeted and ginned up as a pretext for war. So the war became rather known absurdly as the War of Jenkins' Ear. The book is divided into these big sections. The mission, then the, the shipwreck and the disasters that, uh, that befall the survivors afterwards, and then a court martial where the British Admiralty tries to figure out what happens. From the very beginning, you take time in the opening pages describing just the, the harsh and antagonistic relationship between, you know, that's involved in keeping a ship afloat, keeping it crewed, keeping the crew alive. It, the whole thing seems incredibly precarious when you set out on the sea. Yeah, very much so. And I mean, these were floating civilizations. In many ways, um, uh, these ships were, not in many ways, they were the engineering marvels of their time. 
Uh, they were uh, designed both to be lethal instruments. They were loaded with cannons um, and also to be the homes of seamen packed together who might be living side by side in close quarters for as long as three years on an expedition like this. Yet, as sophisticated as these machines were, they were made mostly of very perishable materials, which was wood. It could take as many, this is one of these astonishing facts that you come across, it could take as many as 4,000 trees to build one of these warships. You know, it just gives you pause when you read that. Um, uh -huh. And then they had to, you know, they had to load up these ships with countless tons of provisions, including goats and cattle, which never like to get on a ship. <laughs> Like each each one essentially had a farm on it. <laughs> yeah, they each had a farm yeah. on it. Yeah, they had uh, you know one of them would have about forty miles of rope. Forty miles, forty miles of rope. It's just crazy. Um, and then of course they needed the most important uh, element to operate them, which was skilled seamen. But Great Britain had exhausted its supply of volunteers during the war. It did not have conscriptions, so it sends out these press gangs to round up uh, these men um, in towns and city supports. So they would take a look at you and they'd say, wow, you, you, have, you have that round hat on? Well, that's like a seaman's hat. Or you have a checkered shirt on? That looks like a seaman. Or do you have a little tar on your fingertips, which tar was used on ships? So they say, well, you had tar on your fingertips. Round them up. And they would force you to go on this voyage on Willing Lake. And even after that, they were short of it. And so the admiralty went so far as to round up Men, soldiers in a retirement home, many of whom were in their 60s and 70s, they were missing an assortment of limbs. And several of them were so sick that they had to be lifted onto these ships to go on this perilous mission on stretchers, on stretchers. So, you know, for the very beginnings, you could see the seeds of destruction. It's amazing that any of these ships were able to sail at all. You have a crew that doesn't want to be there. Uh, you have all of the elements pressing against it at all times. Um, and this sort of this powder keg of, of tensions on the, on the ship itself. How, like, how did these societies function? How did you manage to keep as many ships as the British empire did yeah. out and floating on the seas, doing what they were supposed to do? Yeah. These ships really were, as I said, like these floating civilizations, um, they would um, contain people from all walks of life, some as young as six years old, uh, to on the wager, the cook was in his 80s. He in his 80s on this voyage. And, they, and there were aristocrats and dandies. There were city paupers. There was free black seamen. There were professional craftsmen. All these strangers, most of them were all strangers, are suddenly thrust together and they somehow have to be organized into this efficient working organization um, if the ship is to stay afloat. And the British Admiralty had a pretty good track record of forming what uh, Vice Admiral, Horatio Admiral called a band of brothers. And they would do that through regimen and discipline. Um, and it would require, though, a very skilled commander who, there were British commanders who ruled by the lash, but the best commanders, the most effective were, were those kind of leaders who knew how to sympathize, and cajole, and inspire. But the challenge on the wager, for example, as you mentioned, was particularly enormous because so many of the men were pressed and had gone unwillingly, and many of them were sick from the very beginning of the voyage. How how do we know even from the you know really the first weeks of this voyage that things are not going to go well? Yeah, whether well, they things are, are really going bad. I mean, to the point that I mean they 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 get across the Atlantic eventually, but they're kind of behind schedule um, to some degree, and they discover while they're crossing the Atlantic that they're being chased by a, a large Spanish armada which they had not expected uh, to know about their supposedly secret mission. All their secrets had leaked out, and the Spanish had intelligence exactly about all about them and what their mission was and where they were going. So they have to dodge this armada. And then um, they have to get around Cape Horn. And 
I, you know, most of us had heard, well, the seas around Cape Horn, which is at that very tip of South America, the end of the Americas, you know, it's kind of this funnel that goes between the Americas. Uh, uh, the, the the seas are called the Drake Passage. They, they funnel between the end of the Americas and Antarctica. Well, we've all heard that those aren't very good seas. We've all heard those are some of the roughest seas. Well, they are truly among the worst seas, if not the worst seas in the world. Terrifying. Terrifying. And there's there are actual reasons for this. You know, it's like anything when you look into it, you're like, well, I always heard the seas are bad there. Well, why are they bad? Well, turns out that that is the only place on Earth where the seas flow completely uninterrupted around the globe, meaning they're never blocked by land. So the seas are traveling for 13,000 miles, accumulating power. Then they suddenly get funneled into this passage where, the, where also um, the depth suddenly um, uh, decreases, suddenly. And so it generates these waves. Uh, uh, there could be a 90-foot wave that could dwarf a mast. You have the strongest currents on Earth. And you have winds that often blow at hurricane force and can accelerate it to as much as 200 miles per hour. Um, Herman Melville, who in the following uh, later uh, made this uh, uh, journey, he compared it to a descent into hell in Dante's Inferno. <laughs> and it's it's essentially shrouded in mist, fog, clouds all the time. Um, and and geographically, it it's kind of like having your thumb on the end of a hose. Like the oceans are pressurized yeah. through this yeah. through this tiny space. And then you have to take one of these ships through it. Um, and as we can imagine, things don't go well. Um, but before we get to that, we get to know a small number of characters at the outset. One is David Cheap, who ultimately captains the wager. Another has a familiar name. He's the midshipman John Byron, who's the grandfather of the romantic poet we know today. He's Lord Byron and a gunner, John Bulkley. And I imagine Bulkley is someone who wouldn't necessarily sit in the historical record the same way as as Byron and Captain Cheap. Cheap. How did you get to know each of these well enough to be able to place them firmly in the story? Because these are characters we really get to know over time. Yeah. So I decided to structure the book because in many ways, and I'm sure we will discuss this, this is a story not only about a crazy voyage, but also a kind of metaphysical search for the truth and a meditation on the truth and the very nature of truth. And each of them has very conflicting accounts, everybody who's, who goes on this expedition. Um, and so I structured it from the kind of conflicting perspectives of these three men. There is David Sheep, who is the captain. He came from a wealthy family in Scotland. He's a tempestuous figure and a burly figure, um, a very brave figure, a stubborn figure. Back on land, he was always kind of dogged by debts and chased by creditors and kind of embittered by his frustration. But at sea is where he kind of seeks his, his, he hopes to realize his churning ambitions. And on this expedition, he finally achieves what he had always longed for, which is he is promoted to captain of a warship. So he is the leader uh, of the wager. The other perspective is, as you mentioned, John Bull. And Bulkley does come from a different background. He is not from the aristocracy. He was the gunner on the wager. Um, he is, in many ways, the most capable seaman on the ship. And he was uh, a very instinctive leader. It, because he did not come from the aristocracy, he knew that he could never become a captain of a man of war, of a warship under the British hierarchical class system. Um, and then the third perspective is told from John Byron, this midshipman who is 16 years old on the wager when the voyage set sail. Um, unlike many of the other um, members of the ship, uh, he was not pressed. He volunteered for the mission. He's kind of, not only is this book about stories but about, and about the stories they tell, but it's also about how stories influence the very people who are going on the mission. And so his brain is filled with these romantic tales of, li of life at sea. You know, he read all the sea tales and um, was kind of hoping to live this rom romance. And instead, he has to come of age amid the horrors that will be unleashed not only by the natural elements, but also by his shipmates. Um, 
the way I was able to document um, each of these uh, individuals kind of remarkably complex and interesting characters is that there is a um, astonishingly amount of primary resources that have survived this expedition, has survived this journey. There are log books and muster books and journals and diaries and written narratives, many of them that somehow survived typhoons and shipwreck and whatnot. And you can go to England and dig through these archives and pull these dusty, crumbling documents. Uh, and so often you have almost a day-to-day uh, accounting of what transpired. And what's interesting about Bulkley, because you mentioned him, is that unlike Byron and Cheap, we don't actually even have, we don't know what Bulkley li- looks like because he could not afford to have his portrait painted like these other men. Uh, um, but he was a compulsive diarist and very literate. And so he left behind uh, one of the, probably the most detailed written account of, of these events, uh, uh, his journal, uh, where he is uh, documenting everything uh, every day. So even though we don't know what he looked like, we do know very much what he thought. As much as this is a book about disasters and survival at sea, it's it's also a book about narrative, the, the stories that people tell and how they shape them to suit their own interests. Because disaster befalls the wager, they are shipwrecked. And and one of the things that we that we kind of learn is as you say, is that the the British Navy was kind of like a documentation machine. Yes, yes. It was yes. producing records all the time. Yes. And we know from from Bulkley's diaries that the wagers records were destroyed. And he suspects deliberately. Uh, can you can you tell me a little bit about kind of the the events that befall that and why would somebody want to destroy the records of a ship? Yeah, so records were very important to the British Empire. Um and on ships the captain and a lieutenant and a warship were all required to keep log books, these kind of daily accounting of events. And these were done partly to fuel and feed the kind of encyclopedic knowledge of the world to help the British Empire ruthlessly conquer um, other parts of the world so that they would learn about these previously unknown places, how to chart the seas, what the people were like, the indigenous people were encountered, what kind of resources might be there. So they had a deep self-interest, an imperialistic self-interest in documentation. These logbooks on a ship were also very important because they were meant to be a record that if anything ever befell the ship, if something went wrong, if it, the ship was wrecked, if there was a crime, um, these logbooks were evidentiary material. They would be introduced into a court martial. So when things begin to go wrong and there are questions about people's conduct, Bulkley suspects that some of these documents have been purposely uh, destroyed. So, but these documents, you know, just before we get to the island, they recount, uh, you you get a sense of thinking about how everything goes wrong. And just to complete that part of the saga, as they're coming around Cape Horn with these violent seas and they're being bandied about like rowboats in the, <laughs> these titanic waves, at that very moment when they need every person on the ship to operate, that many of them can no longer get out of their hammocks because... They are suffering from one of the worst maritime outbreaks ever recorded of scurvy. And their hair begins, and they document this. They document this to these accounts. Their hair begins to fall out. Their teeth fall out. Some of the semen describe the disease getting into their brains and them rotting, raving mad. Um, and so hundreds and hundreds of them perish. And their bodies are just thrown overboard unceremoniously, as the poet Lord Byron would later say, without a grave, unnailed, uncoffined, and unnailed. I thought it was a very powerful line. Um, and so, you know, 
these ships are just in disaster. They're just being, you know, we haven't even gotten to the real hell yet. <laughs> but these documents <laughs> allow you, they just kind of allow you to to gain access uh, to what is happening and how they're trying to search for. They didn't know what the cause of scurvy was. They're like operating on the dead and trying to figure it out. They didn't realize that it was a nutritional they just needed vitamin C. They didn't. They just knew they needed more vegetables and fruit in the diet, but nobody knew that, that back then. And the other thing that hadn't um, hadn't shown up yet was the ability to really know where you were on a map. There's a a, a little tidbit about a, a, a shipmate of, of Cheap's named John Harrison, who played a crucial role in how sailors would gauge longitude, uh, which was one of the most difficult problems of naval navigation at the time and it's it's just a paragraph in in your book but it feels like a glimpse into kind of this giddy moment in the in the process of research where they were cracking open things that had made it incredibly difficult and dangerous to sail around the world yes so um navigators you know going back in time were able to um very easily uh determine their latitude on the map by reading the stars. But longitude was the great conundrum. And that is because uh, they did not have reliable clocks. Reliable clocks could not fit uh, and serve on a ship. And they needed those in order to measure longitude. Harrison was a great clock inventor and will eventually uh, invent a reliable clock that will allow seamen to calculate uh, their longitude. But that invention was not yet perfected um, and used uh, on these ships. So they are sailing partially blind. They have to rely on what a uh, seaman referred to as dead reckoning, which to make it simplify. <laughs> which sounds as bad as it, it yeah, is. Yeah, it's hundred percent. There's a reason they call it dead reckoning. It's basically a leap. It's basically informed guesswork and a leap of faith. I could get into the details, but that's what it basically came down to. And you could then, so these ships, you know, first they get separated around Cape Horn. They're all trying to stay together because they know if they get separated and something happens to them, there'll be nobody else to rescue them. The wager ends up getting separated from all the ship. It's alone to its own destiny. It comes around Cape Horn under Captain Jeep. It's coming up the coast of, of South America, the, the Patagonia coast along the Chilean side. But their estimation of their longitude turns out to be wrong and wrong by hundreds of and hundreds of miles, and they suddenly hit a submerged rock along the coast. And that's where we end up in the um, in the second section of the book, where this crew is shipwrecked, and and shipwrecks have um, are uh, have this incredibly central role in the narrative of stories of of this time. It was almost like the worst thing that could happen to you is is to be shipwrecked so what happens to our crew as they they find themselves on this island and uh and suddenly realize that they're out there on their own yeah so again it's so important to understand and one of the reasons i spent a lot of time early in the book describing how these civilizations these floating civilizations how these ships are built how these how they live how they're regimented is that you kind of need to understand these artificial words, worlds that are being constructed. And that is the world that these seamen are going to know and expect to know and how the rules and the society that they're going to be governed by. So when a ship goes, that world gets destroyed. And as the wager hits this rock, the rudder shatters, a two-ton anchor falls through the bottom of the ship, leaving this gaping hole. The wager is then another wave washes it onward. So it's now careening through this mine full of rocks until it hits another cluster of rocks and begins to completely rip apart. You have the decks collapsing, all the planks splintering, the mass coming down. You have water surging into this into the bottom of the ship, the bottom of their home, their, their house, their fortress. Rats are scurrying upward. The men who were suffering from scurvy who could not get out of their hammocks, they drowned. But the ship did not completely sink. It kind of almost miraculously rested. Well, miraculously maybe too much, but it, it came to rest <laughs> between these pillars of rocks. And so the survivors climb up on the remnants of the ship and they look out and there through the midst, they see this desolate island 
and they're able using one of the transport boats to kind of ferry themselves ashore. And they haul me, and they're and they're grabbing literally whatever they can under their arms as they as they jump on the boat. Like this is not a well organized evacuation no. at all. No. no, this is mayhem. This is mayhem. And the other crazy thing too, which I didn't know until I did the research, is that most seamen at that time couldn't swim. Uh -huh. So you could imagine when their home and their fortress is sinking, they added level of terror that they one of them couldn't even swim to that. And so they're trying to desperately like climb into the you know the one boat and ferry themselves across back and forth and um and they hope when they get about half of them there are about 250 men who had sailed on the wager by the time they get to the island a little less than 150 of them had survived and managed to get to this island and they think well maybe this could be our salvation but it it, it turns out to be a desolate like it's barren <laughs> it's almost the worst possible place that you yes. could uh, that you could arrange to be shipwrecked from. There's a bit during the chaos of the shipwreck when someone grabs a, a tobacco bag to pack some flour into to to save from sinking so they'll have something to eat, and you note that the the bag wasn't really cleaned out, and then the men get sick from uh, what was made with the flour, and you know, we understand why. Um, but there were an abundance of details like this that that you as a writer have to decide as you're reading them in journals, like, what do I keep and what do I discard? Like, what yes. what's going to help advance the story and what's kind of, um, you know, an extraneous detail that's going to extract? How, uh, yeah, how do you go through that process of of sifting all of this information to pull out the the jewels that are going to put us right in that place yeah uh, so first you have to gather too much information because if you don't gather enough information you aren't going to find the, the, the vivid gems the vivid details so you 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 collect everything and the first time you write it you probably use you almost always use too much you always uh -huh. do um and then you have to but then you have to shift your brain and then you have to be ruthless and then you have to distill and distill so that you're left with those images those details that advance the narrative reveal character and fill something in the reader's imagination now now here we're at a turning point both in the book and in our conversation, because we really have to decide how much we want to tell people and how much we don't. Um, the you know, as things did not go well on the voyage, things also do not go well on <laughs> as, for them. As, as I like to say, that's what, that like to say, like I, I like to say, okay, they've been in hell. Now the real hell begins. <laughs> it's like hell part two. Yeah, hell part two. It's worse. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> like it's not even less wet than being on the ocean no it's cold and barren and they can find virtually no food and they're suffering from hypothermia yeah it's not good and so without without giving too much away can you tell me a bit about some of the forces that start to work on this group that um that expose the weaknesses of the society as they've as they've found themselves on this island yeah so they begin to fracture into warring factions, into separate factions. Society and order breaks down as they are hungry. The capped sheep believes he should remain their commander because he had been their commander at sea, and he believes he should still go governed by the kind of hierarchical regimented rules. He also had finally attained his great prize of being a captain. He was not prepared to let that go. Um, there is another group that just kind of kind of fractures off into kind of marauders. Um, you know, they're, they're they're known as the seceders, and they just roam the island like these little piratical, piratical gang, that kind of terrifying the others. And then there is a large group that begins to gravitate towards Bulkley, the gunner, that instinctive leader who uses phrases like life and liberty. And what's so interesting is on that island, they have these philosophical debates about the nature of leadership and loyalty and duty. Um, but you see as society, as, as one world collapses, 
they struggle to figure out what will be the world and the order in which they live. Should they live by the old order and will that sustain them? Or do they need a new order? Uh, Bulkley talks about how they are now in a state of nature and the old, we have no guidebook to how to live through this state of nature. And we need to come up with our own rules if we are ever going to get off this island. So you see this kind of great antagonism and conflict play out, but also a great philosophical debate about, you know, what should, what is the responsibility? What is the definition of patriotism? What does it mean to rebel? And you get to see it all play out there. You know, I always say, and one of the reasons I was drawn to this story is that island really becomes a laboratory. It becomes a laboratory testing the human condition under very extreme circumstances. And inevitably, it begins to peel back and reveal the hidden nature of each person. And it reveals the good and the bad. You see acts of selflessness, resilience, heroism, and bravery. And you see acts of shocking brutality and murder and cannibalism on that island. And one of the things I found so compelling about those those conversations and debates that they were having is that these were very much active philosophical conversations going on at large in society at that time. This is the time of Voltaire and Rousseau and Hobbes. Like this is when we're talking about what does kind of humankind in its elemental state look like. And and this those were the conversations they were having at yes. uh, at yes. exactly that time. Yes. And it begins to also reveal, I think, something very powerful, not just about the human condition, about nature under certain but also about the folly and the destructiveness of imperialism that was built into this very mission. And the British Empire had always kind of claimed that somehow its civilization was superior to others. And they used that to you know, somehow justify their ruthless expansion destruction. Was that it. Well, what happens on this island here, these apostles of civilization, the vanguard of the British Empire, they slowly and gradually descend into a Hobbesian state of depravity. And I'll jump ahead a bit. Yeah. To say that um, some of the uh, some of the crew are rescued, but they're not rescued all at once, um, and in fact, they're rescued in a couple of groups. And this gets us into the third phase of the book, where we really start to grapple with this idea of different stories being told for different reasons. And so, can you can you set up our return to England and um, and what starts to happen with these different groups of sailors? Sure. So there's this kind of begins with no one group in a tiny little boat washes up along the coast to Brazil. On board are about thirty men whose bodies are wasted to the bone, and they announced they were the survivors of His Majesty's ship, the Wager, and they had been shipwrecked for months, and they had traveled thousands of miles to get and they are initially greeted as kind of heroes celebrated for their ingenuity for surviving and making this trip but then several months later another boat washes ashore this time on the other side of south america washes up along the coast of chile this is even a smaller boat it's like a dugout and on board are three other survivors uh, whose condition is even worse one is so delirious he can't even recollect his name uh, but after they recover, they tell a very different story. They say that those people who have gone to Brazil are not heroes. They were actually mutineers. And so then when the, several of the survivors come back to England from these two groups, um, they are summoned to face a court-martial for their alleged crimes. And this is a book about stories. And Joan Didion famously said, we all tell ourselves stories in order to live. But in their case, it's quite literally true. They must tell their stories in order to live because if they don't tell a convincing tale, they could be hanged. And so they release, many of them release and publish their testimony or their journals, trying to persuade the Admiralty and the public that they were the heroes of the story and not the villains and that therefore their lives should be spared. And, and this sets up a whole second 
narrative arc later in the book that's as much about publishing and how stories get out into the world as it is about uh, you know seafaring or surviving a, a shipwreck we have publishers who are competing with each other to sell the written accounts of different castaways and um and the you know the um the adventures of the admiral who led the whole um uh the whole expedition his stories and so can you can you tell me about this swirl of interest that was going on around these stories at this time yeah it was a kind of a very uh critical moment in the publishing industry um in great britain even parts of europe at that time where you had growing literacy and you had cheaper printing so these accounts are spreading now and these early sea tales in many ways provided kind of a seed for a certain kind of literature that would become enormously popular these log books that we had described early on that this that the captains the lieutenants would keep kind of become the seeds of travel literature these kind of daily kind of journalistic accounts a little more individualism creeping into them um, and so there's a race to publish these. Um, many of the accounts are scandalous because they show the British officers and crew looking like brutes rather than gentlemen. Um, others are celebrated. You have plagiarized versions. What's so crazy is, you know, here the castaways had waged this war, which we described in the previous three sections of the book. They'd waged an endless war against the elephants. Now they wage a war over the truth. And again, there is this disinformation, misinformation, or even allegations of a kind of fake news of these fake journals that are proliferating and being generated. And what is the truth? Um, what was so crazy to me was this was happening at a time in our own modern time, in our own uh, countries, in the United States in particular, but around the world where there were these attacks on untruths. There's claims by politicians of alternative facts or these claims of fake news. And so then I would go back to the archives and I'd be reading these accounts. They're like, oh my God, like, look at this. This is just happening then. And, um, and in a weird way, you get to really document how these wars play out, how each one begins to shade their story and manipulate their story. And you tell me about the book that was supposedly by Reverend Walter. Yeah, this is a classic case. You know, this reminds me of when my uh, uh, one of my children may come to me and say, "I saw something on TikTok," and we'll say, "Well, is it true? Let's get to the bottom of it." And um, uh, so, uh, there was an account by by written reportedly written by Reverend Walter, who had been on the flagship. It was known as the Centurion. It was under the command of the Commodore of the expedition, a man named George Anson, and he wrote this account and it became the best selling of all the accounts. It was read around the world. It was, uh, you know, be read by Rousseau and Voltaire and it was studied. Later historians sleuthing around learned, wow, well, it actually had been had a ghostwriter. Um, and it had been ghostwritten, which was not known at the time. You know, there was inconsistencies in the account because when you read it, Reverend Walter said, at one point, he had witnessed a battle, and he used the he used the he says ah, but it turned out that he had actually left the ship at that point before the battle, so he could not have witnessed it. Then, when they sleuthed a little bit deeper, it was learned that the whole account was effectively engineered and was really the official authorized account by the commodore of the expedition, who had hired the ghost rider, and this helped kind of uh, both. Uh, and burnish his own reputation and burnish the image of the empire. So not only do you have to judge the accounts by their self-interest, you have to figure out like whose self-interest, like whose agenda <laughs> is behind this story. And that story became kind of the dominant narrative. It became the prevailing winning story. Um, and it became the one that empire trumpeted. And so where did it come from? And when you find out where it came from, you begin to be able to figure out its own agenda and its own self-interest. And what is so Interesting, this is not just the wager fair is not only about how individuals shape their own stories to serve their self interest, it is also about how nations and empires shape their own stories 
to serve their self-interest. And the Walter account becomes kind of the mythic alternative version of history that Great Britain seizes upon in trumpets, although it was never actually, or it was partly written by Walters. <laughs> so when all of these stories that are circulating around, some of them are like adventure tales, terrible things that have happened to shipwrecked people and it, you know, it's you know barbarism and um were there some though that that tried to address these more philosophical issues of uh, you know what does it mean to have people in a state of extremis or what is that that yeah that base fundamental humanity that happens when people are in in conditions like this yes they do comment on it um the, the participants comment upon it in a way that is trying to come to terms with the things that they have done or haven't done. So sometimes when a seaman may be abandoned because there's no more space for that seaman on the transport boat, that level of cruelty, how starvation causes them to have very little sense of humanity and care. And so they will, they will comment on that. Later on, these stories would be examined and, and poured over by philosophers and scientists. From them, they would be, you know, um, kind of more deeper philosophical observations drawn. These accounts were studied by Rousseau. They were studied by Voltaire. The scientist Charles Darwin um, read these accounts and wrote one of them on the on his voyage on the Beagle. Later, they would. Um, you know, influence Herman Melville, who cites them in one of his novels. And of course, many years later, Patrick O'Brien drew on the wage of disaster that helped inspire his very, uh, one of his earliest novels. Um, there's even a character in that named John Byron. It was before his more masterful uh, Master Commander series, the Aubrey series, okay. but it helped influence it and kind of provided a prototype for that series. So, these stories continue to radiate out, even though gradually over time, the whole chapter will be largely forgotten. But at the time, it was not. It was a huge deal. And I'm sure you could have gone you know, even further into the cultural dynamics, the commercial dynamics um, that were that were going on at the time. How yeah? How did you pack this down? You must have been leaving a lot of stuff out, as, as we were talking about before. Um, but uh, uh, are there were there pieces of the story? Were there were there details that you that it kind of broke your heart to leave out, or or did you manage to get everything in that you were looking for? I mean, there are always um, you know everything that you love will remain in in some way because if you love it that much but there were passages that i really liked that would be cut out because I, I i will, will i'm an i have a very there's you know me obsessive compulsive nature and so you know if i'm researching something like you know just even the building of the ships i i mean i i just become obsessed like i mean i i'll do digressions like you know uh, you know, for example, sea language. Sea, I could have written a book on sea language. I had no idea until I began this book that like half the language I've been speaking my whole life came from the idioms of the age of sail. You know, scuttlebutt, which was like a barrel of water on the center of the ship where the seamen would gather around for their water rations. What would they do? They would gossip around the water. So scuttlebutt is gossip. Piping hot was the bosun's whistle to to, to the hot meal was ready or piped down was his whistle for to be quiet. Or my favorite one, you know, was uh, the one from uh, Nelson, Admiral Nelson, where he, 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 he wanted to ignore his superior officer's signal flag to retreat. And so he took his telescope and he put it up to his blind eye. So we now use the phrase to, uh, to turn a <laughs> blind eye. So, um, you know, I could have gone on and on about that. And that has to become a paragraph because you don't want that to overwhelm the narrative. And to me, you're writing in some ways within a genre that you're both deconstructing, but you're also playing with. And so this is an adventure tale. This should be a rousing, hopefully gripping story with twists and turns that hopefully has the motion of a ship as you are being propelled for. So you want to maintain that while you are actually kind of deconstructing it. So you have the digressions, you just have to balance them out. 
And my theory on these books, hopefully, who knows if you succeed, is that within that form, if you work within that form, you trick a lot of readers because you can really hopefully make them wrestle with some really serious themes about slavery, imperialism, and about the way we tell stories. What is human nature? What is society? How do we construct society? What stories get left out of our history? What don't we want us to tell? But you're getting hopefully all that within a story where you're turning the pages. I don't know if I succeed at that, but that is always my belief, where if I write a polemic or if I just write a kind of overly detailed history, I'm going to lose a lot of readers. There's one other aspect as well that I thought was this very interesting. And I'm I'm paraphrasing a bit, but you said in an interview with Slate when you were talking about your book, Killers of the Flower Moon, that you think life in the moment is bewildering. Um, things are happening all around you. It's it's hard to make sense of what's going on sometimes. And history as a kind of writing too often misses things because it's written knowing how things turn out. And it obs- which obscures that feeling of of being present in the moment uh, when, when events are swirling around you. Is um, is that one of the things that you were, one of the threads you're pulling on as you were putting this story together? And yeah. is that is that something that you have in the back of your head as you're putting together a book like this? Yes, I have. You know, it's funny, as you can write over time, you, you know, you kind of developed almost um, principles or whatever it is that kind of guide you. They become your North Star. And especially as I began to write history over time, I realized, you know, some of the history books that I read, they're kind of written with this like godlike omniscience, like, you know, this arrogant detective who knew all, knows all that happened because they see it, you know, they're able to look back in time with hindsight, the power of hindsight. But that is not the way we live. That is not the way we experience history. And so I try to tell these stories, these historical stories from the perspective of the people that are experiencing the history as it is unfolding, living inside of history. They can only see part of what's happening. You know, when we walk outside our door every day, we have no idea. You know, we may be going commute, but we don't know what's going to happen. On a voyage, God knows what's going to happen. They don't even know they're going to live the next day. They don't know what the weather's going to be the next day. And so I think it does two things by kind of that principle of writing that way. Um, one is it actually makes a story far more intriguing because people are living with mystery and the mystery is unfolding in real time. These stories are told in real time. So they have the suspense and intrigue that is not manipulated. It is the suspense and intrigue that the very people themselves live with. That you as an historian looking back 300 years, you know, well, I know what happened. I know they're, they're the, uh, that one dies, that one lives, but none of them know that. Um, they don't know the ship's going to wreck. So you kind of let that unfold as it's happening. Um, I think that also gets you closer to the deeper, more fundamental truth of the way history is lived and experienced. It doesn't mean that you don't eventually bring in modern information and fresh perspective, but you let this story unfold in real time. I'm going to go ahead and assume that the wager takes its place with, uh, alongside, uh, your two other very popular books, Killers of the Flower Moon and The Lost City of Z. Um, and these are, they're very different in terms of topic but they all i think they embody a lot of those those principles that you talked about um uh, and they give us a sense of you as a writer of narrative nonfiction. Uh, I, I think i could say a very gifted one but it took you some time to find that that space where you excel and i i understand that you think um you know, being a newspaper reporter you know was not the best place for you to be <laughs> I, can you can you tell me a bit about how you how you found your way 
um, from you know from one medium to another and really locked in on the the medium that works for you the best. Yeah. Well, I think this, you know, we were just, there's a very good transition. We were just talking about the way you tell stories. And I think, I, now I think about the way I tell stories, but I think my instincts were always to tell stories that way. I always kind of would tell stories the way I heard stories from my grandmother, you know, who would tell me these kind of gripping stories about her family, about how my grandfather would fled Russia on foot, any of her relatives perished during World War II. Um, and so when I was a newspaper writer, I would always tell stories from beginning to end. You know, a story begins and you kind of follow it through and then it ends. Um, and every time I would turn in the story, an editor would say, oh, this is really good, but we're going to take your ending and we're going to move it up to your second paragraph because the reader needs to know what's <laughs> going to happen. I think, but if they know what happens in the second paragraph, why are they they're not going to keep reading? There's no surprise. Um, so I just had like this instinctive, and then I spent much of my newspaper career saying, how, this is way too inside baseball, but journalists refer to that as the nut graph uh, in newspaper stories. The nut graph is where you get to a story and it kind of tells you why you're reading the story and the import and what it's about. So I had this game with myself is how far can I bury the nut graph? And I was like, you know, how deep can I get a nut graph in a story, you know, trick an editor. Um, uh, so it just didn't really naturally suit me. And then gradually over time, uh, you know, I began to tell longer stories, find stories that were more of my interest. I began uh, as a reporter covering politics because that was the first job I got at a at a newspaper watching DC. So everyone always saw me as a political reporter, but it was, you know, you, you have to earn a living. So that was, that was, you know, I didn't dislike politics, but it was these, these, I was reporting on a subject that was the one job I could get that would pay me any money. So I was like, okay, I'll take that job. In fact, I don't think there was an alternative of, of any other job. Uh, so I took that job. Um, and then I remember there was kind of a pivotal moment um, when I uh, was doing a political story about a congressman named Jim Traffic. Nobody will remember Jim Traffic. He was this very flamboyant, eccentric congressman from Ohio had this toupee, although we didn't know it was a toupee back then. And I, nobody thought uh, anyone would wear a toupee that bad. But I had learned that he was being investigated uh, by the feds for corruption. And so I traveled out to his Ohio, and I went to a courthouse, and I had heard that he had been investigated um, decades earlier when he had run for sheriff, long before he became a congressman. And he had been investigated for uh, corruption. And so I went to the courthouse and I found a recording. And it was a transcript of an old recording. It was made with a uh, trafficking and a guy named Orly the Crab and Charlie the Crab, two mobsters. Charlie the Crab had since vanished without a trace. He had been, as they like to say, rubbed out. At least that was presumably. And I start listening to or reading this recording and hear the honorable congressman from Ohio keeps dropping F-bombs, every other word. He's talking about taking bribes and he's talking about people coming swimming up swimming in the Mahoning River in Ohio. And I'm like, you got to be kidding me. And so I'm listening to this story and I was like, oh my God, these are the real voices, the authentic voices uh, that I want to try to tell in my story. And it also taught me a real fundamental level that in archives can be sitting these records, these this like this weird transcript of a, of, a, of a recording with this monster that that tells you about the hidden truth that gets you closer to the hidden truth. And so that kind of began a process of trying to tell more stories like that. It was still a long journey of evolution, but that really was the pivotal moment that set me on my way. And there, there must have been a point in that evolution where an editor is saying to you, this kind of story you want to tell is not what I need for these column inches. You need to figure out how to do something else. For a while, I became an editor saying, okay, you give me two of these, I'll give you one of those. You give me two of those, I'll right. give you one of those. And then eventually I was blessed. Uh, you know, I got to the New Yorker magazine, uh, David Remnick, my editor there, Daniel Zaleski. They were the, they were like after they just quickly just said you know what just go do your thing you know you're obsessed passion can generate great stories I really do believe that that if you tap into writers and reporters passions you have to direct them and shape them but if you tap into that it can lead to very fruitful stories David thank you so much for joining us 
Oh, it's my pleasure. Thank you for such a lovely conversation. And I will say this just at the end, that however your day is going, if you read the wager, you'll feel better about your day. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> In almost every facet of your life, you will feel it's better. It's not so bad. I have been speaking with David Graham, author of the new book, The Wager. For links to all of his books, head to Kobo.com slash conversation or click the link in the show notes. And go ahead and share that link with anybody who enjoys talking about books. We think they'll like it here. Kobo and Conversation is produced by Nathan Maharaj and hosted by me, Michael Family. Thank you for listening.